session will ask the pointed question, why are you in business? The panel will discuss what a business owner can do to recognize short-term profitability and maximize long-term equity development or business value to ultimately sell or transition to the business at a point in the future. Our panel will be moderated by Chris Moorhart, president of the Ferris Group. And our panelists include Andrew Cagnetta, president of Transworld Business Brokers, Julie Kleffel, Seacoast Bank's EVP, Christopher Fogel, a CPA and a partner at Proctor, Crook, Crowder and Fogel, and Scott Turnbull, shareholder of Crary Buchanan Attorneys at Law. So while our panelists come on up here, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about each person. Uh, Christopher Moorhart, um, I know many of you know Christopher. He's the president of the Florida-based business management firm, Ferris Group. He received his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and continued his education in business administration at the University of Hartford in Connecticut. In addition to several achievements and certifications in small business practice, Mr. Moorhart has been honored by the U.S. Small Business Administration as Young Entrepreneur of the Year and was presented with two torch awards from the Better Business Bureau for business integrity. As a serial entrepreneur, having successfully started, grown, and sold many businesses, Mr. Moorhart has over 24 years of successful business management experience and maintains a proven strength in business analysis and implementation of success strategies for improved performance and profitability. His diverse background experience lends to an ability to balance practicality with comprehensive solutions and problem solving skills. So that is your moderator, and I think you all know him. So thank you, Chris, for doing this. And now, Julie Kleffel is Seacoast Bank's EVP, small business banking leader. She joined the Seacoast leadership team as a result of a merger between her former institution, Bank First and Seacoast Bank. She's responsible for developing, implementing, and overseeing the bank's small business banking strategies. And prior to the merger, Julie was Bank First's executive vice president and commercial sales leader overseeing the bank's treasury, commercial lending, small business administration, and marketing departments. She has over 20 years of overall banking experience. Julie, thank you for being here. Andy Cognetta, am I pronouncing that right? Yes. Okay. Andy Cognetta Jr. came down to Florida in 1995. While looking to buy a business, he encountered a company named Trans World Business Brokers. He continued his search for a business but was offered a position at Trans World as an agent. He joined the company and quickly became one of South Florida's top performers. Now, uh, over 37 years old, Trans World Business Advisors is the number one business brokerage in the state of Florida and an international franchisor. Andy is a recognized speaker and trainer in the subject of business sales and negotiations. He has taught his self-authored negotiations class to associations, construction companies, media sales teams, government agencies, high school and university students. Chris Fogel joined Proctor Crook Crowder and Fogel in 2009 after more than 30 years of prior experience as a CPA in Florida since 1978. He has a BS in accounting from the New York Institute of Technology and his areas of professional experience include corporate, partnership and individual taxation, elder care planning, estate and trust, business planning and consulting, retirement planning and negotiations. And W. Scott Turnbull is an attorney with Crary Buchanan and Stewart. He represents business entities and owners in a variety of business planning issues. He is a business advisor, negotiator, and litigator on several numerous legal matters. He has a degree in business law from the University of Alabama School of Law. Quite an impressive panel. Thank you all for being here, and you all enjoy their expertise. I will now turn it over to Mr. Moorhart. All right, well, I'm a whole lot more comfortable doing this session than those opening comments and so thankful to have Tiffany here. But this is a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart and something that, um, quite frankly, I could stand up here and speak about for hours, but I'm, I'm thrilled to have this wonderful panel here uh, and these esteemed speakers and business owners, managers uh, themselves, and, and I've had an opportunity to work with all of them as well. And um, so really what we're going to do is just engage in conversation. And we're going to talk about some things that, that all of us tend to experience within our own professional practices um, on a daily basis. And that really is 
you know, looking at businesses and looking at uh, business owners who are operating without an ultimate goal in mind. You know, there are, there are businesses who go at it day after day after day, and they're just working hard and they're working themselves to the bone, and they're they're lacking the the real purpose or the meaning behind what they're trying to do. You, and you you ask them, and we're going to ask our panel, you know, some of the things they hear. But uh, just before we get started, so we understand who's in the room. And I guess uh, we should have gone first because we'd have a lot more people to talk to. But thank you all for being here. You'll get the best information of the day. Um, how many are business owners in the room? OK. Management? And then uh, integral to the uh, company sales role, or are you just here for general information? OK. Just good to know who we're, we're speaking to so we can understand. But these you know, philosophical kind of uh, components about day-to-day -day business management apply to, to different aspects of the business. So as we go through, and, and as Tiffany mentioned, what we're talking about today is, is something that, that we call purpose-driven business. You know, why are you in business? And we ask people why they're in business, and you get lots of different answers. But uh, some answers sound like, well, for a paycheck, or to take care of my employees or you know, because I need to eat. You know, and so those are not good reasons, and we're gonna give you some good reasons why you should be in business. But I wanna ask our panel, and we'll, we'll start with Scott, and we'll just go down the line and say, what kind of responses do you get when you ask people, why are you in business? Uh, frequently I hear that uh, they are in business to create wealth for themselves and their employees, and they love the challenge of running and operating a business. Yeah, I, I think to eat is a good reason to be in business. But, you know, we do hear that, you know, they, they want some for, sort of fulfillment beyond perhaps working for someone else. So I hear that a lot as well. I think um, probably the common answer is that they want to build profit for themselves as opposed to someone else. Uh, and that they want to carry out what was a dream of theirs. And it may have been birthed at someone else's company but then the idea may have evolved from there and they wanted to take it to the next level. So from my perspective, it's really about how they execute that dream on their own. Well, certainly I think one of the terms is independence. Um, I think many people want to go into business because they have a dream or an ambition that there is something that they can do better than their competition. So they want to seize that opportunity and so the idea of being independent and being able to control, control one's own destiny becomes very key. Well, thank you. you know, one of the uh, underlying philosophies that we have at Ferris Group and I, I share with my, my business partner, Dave, who's in the audience is uh, you really should own a business for the ultimate creation of wealth. And we did hear a, a little bit of that, but you know, what's your end game? What, what's the ultimate plan? And, and part of what we're gonna be talking about today is, is exit strategy planning, whether you just started or you've been in it for 30 years, you know, what's your goal? What, what are you trying to achieve? And so um, I thank you for, for those answers. Um, one of the things we wanted to try and bring to the audience today was an understanding of, of the operational or philosophical difference between operating your business with a goal in mind and not operating your business with a goal in mind. So can you uh, kind of dig into that one a little bit as far as your experience working with privately held business owners and and I'm sure you've worked with both. All of you have probably seen that. There are those business owners who are, are very dedicated to a specific goal, and they operate with that in mind day to day. And then those who don't, they can kind of talk about the differences here. Well, I've had the opportunity for a number of years to teach a course at the Graduate School of University of Florida in succession planning. And one of the things that I always given them was a house. I draw a picture of a house. I said, if you're going to operate a business, think of it as constructing a house. You need plans. You need permits. You get into the tax issues, the license, license issues that people forget about. But one of the things that I always have seen, every time I drew the house, I asked all the students, what's missing? And none of them got it. Not one student in any class. And it was the back door of the house because they build a house with the way to get in, but they don't build the house with the way to get out. Some people live in the house with just one person, but some have many people. And so these are complications within a business. And so in building a business, one ought to take a look at it as constructing a home. 
because all the components of the home, risk, insurance, compliance, architectural plans, and entrance and exit, those are all the things that I believe are um, incumbent upon someone going in. And I've worked with Chris and Dave and others here, and oftentimes they are there, they're just happy making money, but they have not adopted the succession plan. They have not adopted the exit strategy. And so these are some of the frustrations that we have in business with many of our clients that lack those uh, fundamental tools that are essential in the construction of a business. I would, I would echo Chris's comments. The, you know, the challenge I see when you find a business that doesn't start with a plan is that they get caught up, much like people that work for other companies, in what I call the tyranny of the urgent or the vortex of the day-to-day -day crisis management. And they miss critical issues that can affect the success or impact the failure of the business. And, you know, I was counseling a client uh, earlier this week and she went through a business broker to purchase a business and she and her husband wanted to have the independence that we were speaking of momentarily ago. And, 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 and she came down into a business that she knew nothing about and a very intelligent woman, but what she determined was that she thought she had a plan, but because she didn't go back and follow the plan, she got caught up in the whirlwind and things like uh, bookkeepers that were not um, financially responsible um, and we had integrity issues and we had inventory control issues and, and she said, I feel, I feel silly that I didn't see it. And I said, well, it's not uncommon that you get caught up in the in the customer screaming of the day in your business or where's the order or whatever the business may be. And I think you have to start with a plan like Chris talked about, but you have to reference the plan and you have to understand the plan needs to be a moving target. So as the business goes through its various life cycles, that plan needs to ebb and flow and change. And one of the things I would share is that it's critical for any business owner to have key partners and those key partners are mentors or other business professionals that focus in and around the expertise that they don't have and you have to surround yourself with people that have expertise in, in multiple areas and a lot of them are across the hall in the in the room we see and, and in the room here and i think that it's important that we we're all not experts in everything and i think that's critical yeah, I, I always tell business owners they're either going to leave their businesses, you know, walking out their toes first, they can choose. But, and, and, you know, listen, running your business can be overwhelming and you can get sucked into the day to day. I'm a, I'm a fan of Michael Gerber's E Myth. If you haven't read the E Myth, it's a great book about how to try to systematize your business so, you know, you're not in the day to day. You're, you're, you're not, you know, you're managing your business, not quite running it on a day to day basis. You know, I, I, I like that thought process that the, the plans need to change. You need to be flexible. You need to be able to move and um, you know be a speedboat. And that's what, that's was that's your edge as a small business compared to big conglomerates that you can change quickly and change tabs. But you know, looking toward the future of managing toward an exit is you know a lot about just trying to keep good systems in place and. The reason why we work with Chris and Ferris Group so often is so many people just, you know, they manage their businesses for short-term gain or to manage not to pay taxes. And and that really hurts them. Two things in the long run, they're not making the right investments. And number two is they're not creating equity uh, in their value uh, and just trying to quote unquote cheat the government. So, uh, if, you know, you have to get out of that mentality at some point and say, you know, listen, I'm in business to eat and make money along the way, but, you know, what am I building here and how, how, what systems do I need to put in place to put something, to create something of value that perhaps you can step back from a few days a week as well. Thank you. I, I'm going to work with Chris's analogy on the house from the legal perspective. And I think if you, you look at, at the house as your business, um, you have enterprise risk and you have internal risk and you have external risk. Um, an example of, of external risk to your business is regulatory compliance. Just about every industry has some regulatory burden 
and failure to comply with that reg those regulations can affect your profitability. It can affect your ability to sell your business and maximize the profit of it. Um, there's um, business interruption risk. That's another external threat. I mean, we live in a great state, but we have hurricane seasons, and we've had hurricanes, and that can cause business risk. And um, that's something you should discuss with your, insu your insurance uh, team. Um, internally to the business, inside the house, you know, the, the, the owners of the house need to have rules governing their relationship. And what happens if, if there's a dispute that arises between the, the homeowners or the business owners? Do they have a, an agreement in place that um, dictates how we're going to resolve issues? Uh, what are the rights and obligations and duties of the, uh, the owners? We typically look to the shareholder agreement or the operating agreement or some type of internal document that's going to deal with the internal risks of owning a business with others, whether it's family members or non-family members or active members in the business or um, silent uh, partners who uh, invest a lot of money but sometimes aren't so silent. So, you know, that's another example of an internal risk. Uh, uh, key employees can be an internal risk to the house. I mean, you've got a cook in the kitchen, you've got uh, uh, the butler, etc. I mean, they, they need to be well compensated. If they're key employees, you, know, you need to have agreements in place to protect your business interests. And if the chef up and leaves, who's going to make the meals and how are we going to serve the, the kids? So, you know, that's a, that's a good example, you know, of, of the house and how it relates to the business. Um, intellectual property is becoming a huge uh, business asset and it can it can be a risk externally and internally if you don't have the procedures in place to protect your trade secrets or monitor your proprietary confidential information and that can be taken from you that can cause a risk to the profitability of your business um, you need to think about um, protecting that intellectual property with trademarks copyrights uh, patents if you will depending on the nature of the business and so that's an internal and external risk. And those are all examples of using the house analogy with your business that if you look at, you know, from, from your business lawyer's perspective, I kind of look at the enterprise risk and work with my clients on identifying those risks and doing the things that we need to do with your CPA, your business advisor, uh, your insurance uh, salesperson to minimize those risks and so that you can, you know, operate your business towards that purpose profitably and exit down the road. Um, when you need to sell or want to sell. Just sitting here and just thinking how powerful it is to have a group of advisors like this, you know, the, the business attorney, the CPA, your banking relationship, and other trusted advisors from a business perspective. You know, this is indicative of how you should be surrounding yourself on a day-to-day -day basis to run your business. You know, and you, know, you referenced the, the E-Myth, Andy referenced the E-Myth. Um, the principle behind the E-Myth, if you're not familiar with it, is that Entrepreneurs think that because they are good at something, you know, the hairdresser, the widget maker, the, the lawyer, or the you know, electrician, that they're great at their trade or skill, and that automatically applies to sound financial management and human resources and legal advice and, and taxes. You know, all those things are usually outside the core competency of that individual. So why do they try and do it on their own? Uh, so thank you all for your perspectives on that. Uh, Andy also kind of led into one of our other uh, discussion points is tax strategy. You know, I, I think every banker in the room and, and everyone else, anyone else in uh, either business brokerage, we all see uh, that people drive down their, their taxable income so they don't have to pay the government. But what it does is, is ends up minimizing the equity in the business. So I'd like you to talk about that and talk about applicable tax structures, how people should be operating their business. Well, we have a little bit of experience in that. Uh, I think the issue is when we talk about the example of building a house, is what your long-term goals are for the business. For example, if you're thinking about taking something that you've created that you believe one day you're going to take public, possibly a C corporation might be a lot better alternative than just an uh, an S corporation or a partnership. So you really need tax strategy starts at the very incubation of the business. Um, and I know that uh, uh, Scott can give us all different types of entities for the LLC, which can branch apart into just about any entity you want it to be from a tax standpoint. 
But Scott hit up on a point that I will tell you that sometimes will blow up tax strategy, and that is the ability to, or the desire not to pay taxes. I have seen, and I look at my partner, Mike Cook over there, uh, we have seen so many times where business people have tried to bypass sales tax issues or bypass, bypass federal tax issues. And from the Florida Department of Revenue standpoint, you are going to be audited. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, because that's the only revenue the state has. And I will tell you, it's far more difficult working with the Florida Department of Revenue than it is the Internal Revenue Service. And they're nasty, because that's all the money they can get. And Internal Revenue Service, I see them take businesses that thought they were doing well, and when they got done, they were upside down. Because they didn't pay their payroll taxes, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't pay attention to the compliance issue. So tax strategies are, one, is being in compliance. And secondly, I tell my clients, I want your taxes to go up every year. I do, because that means you're gonna be more profitable. It's the disciplines that you put in place to minimize your tax bite in terms of planning when to do some capital expenditures, maybe before the end of the year or after the end of the year, deferral strategies, adopting a cash or a cool basis, tax basis. There's all kinds of tax strategies, but you have to understand what your business is all about, where you want to go, how you're going to get there. But you've got to surround yourself with competency in terms of the tax areas both federal and state, because I will tell you, many of our clients have gotten caught in the state issues where they were selling things in other parts of the state and there's local tax options in different counties and they were only treating it as if they were selling it here. And we've seen it all across the board in all types of businesses, from restaurants to manufacturing, you name it. Some manufacturing clients that we picked up were paying sales tax on machinery and equipment. State has an exemption. If they would have talked to their professional, they would have avoided paying taxes that they didn't have to pay. So to me, tax strategy is an ongoing thing. That's also an ebb and flow because things are changing. I, think, I don't know if we'll talk about today, but just something NASA came down now from the DOL on the overtime. And that's going to be a whole nother uh, can of work. So I will not step on a CPA about tax strategy ever, because that's not my area of expertise. But I will speak to the foundational blocks around financial management and related to bookkeeping and tax management. And one of the biggest pitfalls I see in, in financing small businesses is their lack of focus and prioritization around managing excellent in-house books as well as partnering effectively with a professional in the tax preparation area. You know, in small business, you're always looking to save money. So it's like, well, I'll do TurboTax, I'll do uh, a, a smaller tax service, and that'll work. But what I see a lot of times is that in that process of trying to save money, it costs the business a fortune. So to Chris's comments about uh, both federal and state tax issues and payroll issues, I've seen it cripple and kill a company and destroy a company many times. But I also have seen the inability to manage your day-to-day -day financial management in-house cripple and kill a company because you weren't paying attention or didn't have the ability to pay attention through appropriate financial bookkeeping about what could be happening inside your company through, unfortunately, embezzlement, and mismanagement of funds within your own company and key employees potentially. So, you know, QuickBooks is sort of the go-to program for small business as far as internal bookkeeping, but it's garbage in, garbage out. It's, it's a software system. And if you don't know how to use QuickBooks and you don't know how to use it effectively, QuickBooks for Dummies is not a good place to start. It's, you, there are professionals and people that specialize in that program, and I would highly encourage you to get some education around that. But it's an excellent program to start, but you actually have to look at what it outputs. So I've seen many clients send that information into a bank, for example, or to a financial institution for financing, and we have brackets in the assets section because of a company overdraft, for example, and it's an accounting entry. Well, you can't tell a banker it's an accounting entry, right? I need to know why the accounting entry looks that way. And let's talk to your accountant. Well, I don't have one of those. 
let me talk to your bookkeeper. Well, there they did that. So I would tell you that it's really critical that that those those building blocks, the infancy of a business, you're using the right systems, you understand the systems and the information going into the systems is, is looked at regularly. The the other thing is I oh I don't look at financial statements. I'm a small business. I just do taxes. Well, how do you manage your day to day operations of your company without knowing what's going on with your inventory, with your receivables, with your payables? How how do you do that if you aren't looking at some type of a bookkeeping system? So it's really critical. It's impossible today to get bank financing or any type of legal financing without accuracy within the books. And that's your financial statements and balance sheet and understanding that you need both um, and having accurate tax returns. And today, financial professionals, because of regulatory requirements, are much more intense around the quality of those financial statements and how well you understand them as a business owner. So, uh, you know, it can be as simple as making sure you have the right internal team member that can help manage those day-to-day -day things. But I think it's really important that you understand that just buying QuickBooks in a box doesn't fix it. And then what goes into that system is really important. And ultimately, the output of that going to a financial institution or potentially down the road when you're looking to sell the business, the quality of those financials has to be there or you're not going to be able to get a professional business broker to help you with the transaction. You're going to have a difficult time um, finding uh, a valuation that's appropriate for a potential seller. And so um, you can't have your cake and eat it too as a small business owner. And, and we get small business owners, it's tax planning, I didn't make any money. And I, I say, be careful what you ask for, because if you didn't show any money, I can't lend you any money. I have to be able to see a cash flow stream, and that has to be evidenced through your tax returns and financial statements. And so as you work with a professional team, like Chris and a, and a CPA firm or with your attorney or business broker, it's really critical that those tax planning strategies that you're putting together don't put your business in, an, in a deficit situation just for the purpose of tax management because you may not be able to finance the next piece of growth that you need. And uh, the other way to put uh, tax management it, or not being able to sell your business is you can't steal it twice. So, and and... You know, listen, as I see thousands and thousands of tax returns, I've uh, sold thousands and thousands of businesses, and I, I have a speech that I give to Rotary Clubs and Chamber of Commerce is called uh, 12 Ways to Make Your Business More Value Valuable. Four of those ways is keeping better books and records. If you are a small business, you must have a CPA. You cannot okay. operate QuickBooks. I'm telling you right now, you can't. I mean... Uh, you need a professional CPA. You absolutely should have a computer system running your company so you can have accurate financials on the go. You should meet with your accountant more than once a year. You're showing up with a shoebox and a checkbook uh, is not a way to run your business. And, you know, it, listen, if you're going to manage your taxes, and of course, we all want to manage our taxes. Even Bernie Sanders only pays 15 percent. But it was a joke. Um, <laughs> but listen, he... Uh, everybody wants to manage their taxes. Uh, the good news in, in my world is I've seen it over the years. 80% of the people 20 years ago when I got into business would steal cash. Uh, and there was a huge amount of cash going around. There's not as much cash going around anymore because of credit cards. And even when there's a cash business, uh, many of them have point of sale uh, computers these days. So we're seeing much cleaner books than we used to. Uh, but I'm telling you, if you're, gonna, if you're going to manage your bottom line, the best way to do it is n please don't play with inventory. It's impossible to unwind later. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, I've seen people use two different corporations uh, with two different tax years, putting money in and out and have two different corporations. I mean, the more complicated you may, let me tell you, there's really smart people at the state and at the IRS. They're going to figure out your little scheme. So, so why not just keep it simple? And, you know, if you're going to quote unquote, uh, manage anything and have an aggressive approach to your taxes, the best thing to do is perhaps, you know, try to write off some more expenses, you know, and lean on your business a little bit more for some things and do everything you can to invest in your business moving forward. But I would tell you, if you can't afford to pay your taxes, then something's wrong with your business model. You need to be able to be, produce enough profits to include your partners, which is the state 
and the federal government. And if you go to sell your business or need financing along the way, and let me tell you something, everybody wants to plan to sell their business, but things happen. People move, people get sick, and it becomes time to sell your business much quicker than you wanted to. And you're gonna need to be ready. And the banks will only finance your business if you have good books and records. And if you do not have good books and records, and guess who finances your business if the banks won't? That's you. And the difference can literally, and, and also if a bank can finance your business, if you have good books and records to the point where your, an SBA loan can be applied against your business, uh, your business is immediately worth more. So people seek businesses that they could leverage into and have good books and records. So just by having good books and records, your business is worth more on evaluation purposes. And second of all, if, if you're going to finance your business, which terms are usually about half down, let's say your business was worth half, half a million dollars, you sold it for $250,000, you had to pay fees, you walk with $200,000 in your pocket. If you were able to finance that business, say it probably would be worth a little bit more, maybe $600,000, you'd get perhaps 90% down. So instead of walking with $200,000, you're walking with $540,000 or so, or 500. That's a big difference when you're going to invest your money later on. So um, it's really, really important that you, you know, have good financial. And if you don't, and you don't start out that way, I'm telling you, you need a company like, you know, Chris and Ferris Group to come in and help because straighten it out. Because if, if you're not doing it now, you should. <clears throat> I would agree with all those comments, and, and, and when I meet with a client to discuss uh, financial tax issues along with the other legal issues that come up, I want to make sure that they do have you know, good quality um, uh, accounting, CPA advice um, from the formation, uh, from the startup phase when we're discussing what kind of entity they're going to select and what kind of tax treatment they want to use, all the way through um, dealing with um, the, the various uh, business owners. I mean, sometimes you have an individual who is putting in all the sweat equity and, and you have uh, another business owner who's putting up the money and each of them have different uh, tax burdens and, and, and needs. And so that's an important conversation to have with your CPA or the entity's CPA so that we can kind of structure um, capitalization of the company, financing the company from a tax uh, perspective or take the tax perspective in as well. And the tax strategy, financial management strategy, obviously plays out at the end game uh, when you're trying to sell your business. And uh, depending on how the business is owned, if it's a closely held family business and you're transitioning it to the next generation, there's one set of tax strategies that are involved. If you're selling the business to key employees, that might involve another type of uh, tax strategy and financial management. And if you're selling it to a third party, um, that may take re require another uh, uh, tax strategy. So you can't just decide on a whim or at the last minute what you're going to do and expect the tax strategy to play out because it, it takes um, not just months but sometimes years to plan and position the company and the owners in a position where they can execute and optimize on a tax strategy. And, and that's why I really like and enjoy working with, with CPAs um, as my partner with the business owners and, and putting together a strategy. And then I will also comment um, from a legal perspective on uh, the, and the buyer's <coughs> perspective. When they're buying a business, they want to see solid financials. They want to see audited financials. They want to see tax returns. And during the due diligence period, the buyers and their, and their lawyers and their CPAs are going to um, go through those financial statements, those tax returns, um, line item by line item. They're going to ask for supporting documentation. They're going to question entries. And you need to be prepared to address questions and issues that come up during the due diligence period so that you can maximize the, the value of that company that you're selling. And please, I tell them to please have a shareholder's agreement if they have more than one <laughs> <Right>. shareholder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. I addressed it earlier. It's kind of like if you're the owners of the house, you need to have rules of the house. The rules of the house are going to be are going to be um, determined by that shareholders agreement or the operating agreement. If you don't have an operating agreement, the state of Florida has a statute called the uh, Limited Liability Company Act that will impose a, an agreement on you. Um, and uh, with respect to shareholders, the same thing. Or we'll be in court arguing about who said what and, and where and why. And, and it, it's an ugly situation to be Always. in. Always. And expensive.
Thank you all. <clears throat> you know, I, I hope what you're hearing are, are day to day operational uh, suggestions. This is not about, you know, I'll, I just want to get my business successful and then I'll start doing these things. You know, I, I just need to make a lot of money, then I'll talk to the CPA or then I can uh, talk to the attorney. Now, these are implementation um, uh, aspects for your business day one. You know, set a good firm foundation, start operating right from the beginning, and then grow your business as a result of that and grow those operational philosophies as you go along. Um, so let's, let's wrap up with uh, an understanding of business valuation. And you each have your own unique perspective, right? From the tax perspective, the banking perspective, the, the exit uh, professional perspective, and the legal perspective. And so what are the, the uh, uh, factors that are important to you and important to the business owners to consider from each of your unique perspectives? Well, you know, there's the, the formal business valuations that, that are done. And um, we, our firm has prepared them. We also have relied on them. <clears throat> but I think we go beyond the valuation because oftentimes it's, it's the dive down beyond the valuation that's going to be critical for our clients that are either buying uh, or could be selling. For example, their vendor relationship. If they're in a unique business where they're totally dependent on one or two vendors, that could be a plus or it could also be a, a detriment. The same thing with their customer base. We, we want to look at their customer base. Are, there, are they clients, for example, that contracts will expire in a year or two and there's a potential that they might not be able to renew those contracts? So we dive down into the type of customer base they have. Or if they have one or two customers that might make up 40 to 50% of their activity, the potential risk of losing those customers and what that might do and how that might enter into whether we buy it. Uh, existing contracts that the business itself has, are those contracts going to threaten our client who might be buying it in terms of what they want to do when they acquire it? In other words, having some constraints that might prove difficult. Leases. This is one I will tell you I've seen missed so often are the leases. I, I, <laughs> I've seen valuations all day long, but I, I, the, the, the leases to us are real key. We have a client who has a restaurant that I will tell you it's to die for. The lease is incredible. And it's got uh, a 10-year with two five-year options. And because this uh, entrepreneur took a, a gamble at renovating this particular place, the, the lease cost probably represents 3.5% of their sales, which is very, very good. And that's a plus if you're going to exit. So leases um, are, are extremely important part. Um, the intangibles, if you've got a couple key employees that are integral in that business and you're selling that business, if you can have employment contracts with those key employees, or is it possible when you sell, they go? So the intangibles are also going to be critical aspects. Um, and whether or not this particular business you're buying has addressed the pain points of the customer that you're addressing. Too often, we get enamored with our own products and we forget about the customer. So to the extent that the business that you're buying has addressed the pain points of the customers you're selling, those are all the key things that we look out outside the valuation. So the valuation for us is a base but there's all these other intangibles that we look at in terms of either helping our client acquire the business and advising them of some of the things they need to try to remedy or solve or negotiate the price down, if the case may be, or if we're representing the seller, some of the things that may not show up in the valuation, but are definitely solid benefits that can enhance the sales value that go beyond the traditional EBITDA and the EBIT is a, is a term, and they talk about multiples. But I will tell you, when you get into with investment bankers, mm -hmm. EBITDA plays some role, but they go into these other intangibles to build up the value of their business. So there's a lot of components, but the key at the end of the day is you as a business person need to have all that intelligence before you turn it over to have mm -hmm. the broker put it up for sale. You need to have that information in hand. So I'm, I'm going to talk about valuation from a real life story because I think it's 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 helpful to understand. So a business owner operating a very successful uh, business, looking to 
um, by another business that had been in business for 30 years. True story, real life companies. And um, had approached uh, the bank about how do we go about doing that? No one can seem to get their head around financing that. Can you walk me through that? And I started chatting with them. And, and the first question I ask is, what is a guy in the trucking business doing buying a composting business? That was my first question. And, and the answer was a, a good one in that he had a similar business through another partner that had a, a composting element to it. But the key ingredient was that the trucking company was providing all the hauling for the business that he was purchasing, which was the composting business. And the value to him was the high cost of the movement of the product was killing the margins in the company it was buying. So number one, I, I always ask the question, why? Why would a general contractor buy a restaurant? Well, they probably shouldn't do, do that, but there may be a reason. So as a banker looking at financing a sales transaction, the first question we ask is, why are you buying the business? The, the second thing in this story that, that is interesting is I said, have you ha do you have a buy-sell contract? Do you have a contract? No, we're, we're just good, good friends and we're handshaking it. And in this case, they are really good old boys, okay? And I said, that's awesome that it's a friendly transaction, but, but the first thing I'm going to suggest is that you both have attorneys on both sides of this transaction so that you remain friends. And I said in the valuation process, if we don't have a buy-sell agreement, how are we coming up with a sales price? Well, he thinks it's worth $4 million. Okay, well, we need to have a, a baseline for that. And, and if we're going to finance that transaction, we absolutely have to have an understanding of what are we buying and what is it really worth to the next person owning it. And in this story, what we found is that there were attorneys on both sides, but the attorneys hadn't really been able to or allowed to be able to drill into the buy-sell. But the other piece of that was no formal valuation had been done anywhere of any kind, not a, not a real estate appraisal, which most business owners think that's the only thing if I own real estate, that's the only thing I have to have evaluated. No, this company had over a million dollars worth of fixed equipment assets that are critical to functioning the company. So we needed to know what that equipment was worth, what the life value of that equipment was worth. And if we didn't have this equipment, we couldn't operate this company. And the end game of the, the story is this, this, this friendly transaction was a million dollars more than it should have been. And the positive end of it is that they worked it out among themselves through their attorneys and their CPAs once we got everybody to the table that we are going to get an independent valuation and determine what it was. But it all came down to what Chris was saying. It was the intangibles of the business. We're always looking for the quality of the customer base, the sustainability of the customer when you, Mr. or Mrs. Business Owner, are gone. Are you the face of the company and are you the person that customers do business with? If you are and you exit, what's the transition? Will those customers leave with them? We look at the, some of the other areas that Chris talked about, about the concentration of the customer base, but then I also look at what makes a great business is the greatness, the great customers and the great employees. So who's going to remain behind and what are you doing about that? But ultimately, when you go to a bank to finance a, a, a transaction, the valuation is very much conditional on our ability to have a outside the good old boys were friends and we think the business is worth it. We need to understand what it, what are you buying? And most people when they're looking at valuations don't understand the difference between am I buying the assets of the company or am I buying the stock of the company and what does that entail? And a lot of what I see is we don't have a discussion about leverage in the company. You can have a perfectly debt-free company that's making a ton of money to the bottom line. And to the story I just told, this company was dropping a million dollars to the bottom line, and it was less than $5 million in revenue. But it had no debt, and it hadn't had debt for over 20 years. Now we're going to leverage the business to the tune of a couple million dollars, and now those margins aren't going to look the same. That profitability structure isn't going to look the same. And that hadn't even been thought through. So... We, they didn't even determine whether or not they were going to keep the receivables and who was taking care of the payables. Simple things like that because we're friends and we should be able to work that out. 
Well, if you don't think through that and you get to the bank and you say, I'd like to finance this transaction, it's going to be very difficult. Of a, it will be a very difficult and painful process. And in the case of this, what should have taken probably 60 days took several months and the valuation changed over that period of time. It all worked out in the end and the company has been transitioned and the, we, the financing got done, but it was a very difficult process that didn't have to be handled that way. And there could have been significant employee and customer disruption along the way. So I think Chris makes a good point about the intangibles. And, and I also think you have to think about um, the friend functionality of things when it's a, it's a transaction and make sure you have independent people representing both sides so that they remain with friends on, on the backside. So um, the most important thing in business valuation is profits. And then secondly is profits. And then thirdly is profits. <laughs> but, and, and all those things that all the customer concentration issues, all the issues intangibles, all those things are going to affect the ability for the buyer. Business valuation is about how much will a buyer make in the future with a business. We only look back because that's the simple man's way of drawing a line into the future saying, well, if everything stays the same mm -hmm. and all the all these things are going to move forward, we can look at the past tax returns. And I'm telling you, for small businesses, if you're getting an SBA loan, the most of the profits need to be on the front page of the tax returns. <laughs> yes. That means it needs to be in the owner's compensation. It needs to be in the net. It needs to be in the interest or depreciation, <laughs> the EBITDA, quote unquote. You, you can't bury a ton of stuff on the back page. They might take some of it, but if you're burying things in auto and phone and education for your kids and camps and clothing and it's hard and a, and a T and A to travel and entertainment. It's hard to bring that back where a bank's going to finance it, which will affect your value. Again, values, you know, fair market value is 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 a great place to start, but it's not the end game. The end game is having the right buyer. So there, you had a strategic buyer who's buying a business because they were going to get probably more profits because now they controlled not only the transportation but the supply and the customers. So it's about finding the right buyer and it's about understanding how, how much, it, it, all the things that are going to affect the ability for a buyer to make those transitions and, and all the risk involved. And, and what you're trying to, what the buyer's trying to do is understand the risk. The sellers <coughs> want to get the most money for the business that they can. The, 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 the banks are trying to be um, concerned about their leverage and their cash flow moving forward. So all those things you need, all the, you know, Again, you need good books and records to be able to show that profit to the buyer. And at the end of the day, um, uh, multiples uh, increase as the quality and quantity of the earnings increase. So the, the qu quantity is if a business makes $50,000, it's probably worth maybe one times. If a business makes $500,000, it may be worth three times. If a business makes $5 million, it could be worth six to seven times or five times. So all those things... Uh, you know, and then quality of earnings is how, how, how can I show those earnings? Can I prove those earnings? And are those earnings going to be reasonably assumed by a buyer moving forward? And can I leverage into those earnings? It, 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 very complicated way of saying, listen, you, you need to be able to show people that your business is viable, not only to you, but to them in the future. And to mit mitigate those risks, I'm going to turn it over to this guy. Mm -hmm. Well, from a legal perspective, we see business valuation come up at, at, the, at the formation stage uh, during the, the, the life cycle of the business where they're borrowing money and, and at the end when they're trying to sell the business. And probably the most difficult discussion to have with clients is about business valuation at the formation stage. Well, they're saying, well, the business isn't worth anything now. Well, it will be worth something down the road. And what happens if, and I'm talking about typically in the situation where it's, it's a non-family business, it's individuals who aren't related who go into business together, what happens with one of your business partners dies? And their estate wants to, you don't want to have the spouse, surviving spouse, become the business owner. So how do you value the business to buy out that estate's interest? Or if one of the business partners becomes disabled, or one of the business partners get a, gets a divorce, and that business asset goes into play during the divorce proceedings. So there's a lot of things that can happen uh, with the business owners uh, while owning the business that may require a business valuation. 
And so there's different ways that you can uh, attack the business valuation at the formation stage, and that's usually uh, through the shareholder agreement or the operating agreement or some other agreement where you basically define at the beginning, this is how we're going to evaluate, value the business if some event happens, disability, death, divorce, or I just want out. I've had it with you guys. I can't take it anymore. Give me my money and let me go. So, you know, you can do an annual uh, uh, valuation and, and do that every year and work with your CPA on it. You could build in a structure where each side um, gets an appraisal, and if those don't agree, the appraisers hires a third appraiser and they come up with a valuation. Or you can do something what's called the Texas Showdown Clause, where the partner that wants to um, be bought out or wants to buy the other puts up a number, and that number's the number. You either take it or you, or, or you spend it. In other words, if I'm going to buy out my partner at a million dollars, I better be willing to sell my interest at a million dollars as well. So that's the showdown clause, and there's variations on a theme of that. So there's a lot of different ways that you can creatively deal with valuation at the formation stage. And then um, at the end game, you know, business valuation from the legal perspective is part of the due diligence process. If there's a business valuation, you know, from the buyer's perspective, we're going to really drill down on it. And uh, there's a lot of room to um, tear that number down. And as Chris mentioned, all the different issues that come into coming up with that number can be challenged. And so, you know, if you're going to have a business valuation uh, number going into a sales situation, you better be prepared to address the weaknesses in that number so that you can maximize the value of your business when you're selling it. You know, I wanted to throw one question at you because when we put in these agreements, one of the questions is, should we provide for mediation or arbitration? Mm -hmm. What's your thought on that? Well, alternative dispute resolution is, is a much better forum for resolving disputes between owners than, than throwing your dispute into court. So, you know, the shareholder agreement, the operating agreement is a contract between the business owners. You can build into that contract how you're going to resolve disputes. And you can say, we're going to forego a jury. We're going to forego the court process. And we're going to build a mechanism for a private dispute resolution process with the American Arbitration <laughs> Association or JAMS or some other entity that's going to help us resolve our dispute. And as part of that process, we might have 30 days of negotiation. If we can't resolve it, then the next step might be mediation, non-binding mediation or binding mediation, where we use a mediator to come in and do some shuttle diplomacy. And then the third option, well, we'll go arbitrate, and that'll be binding. But arbitrate that alternative dispute resolution process is quicker, more efficient, and less costly than going to court for a variety of reasons. Thank you. I, I like I like mediators better than arbitration. I, I, I think you should start there. Just practically, I've seen it work a lot better. Sometimes arbitrators are, are a lot of times, I've seen them just kind of split the baby a lot and not really listening to both sides. So I, I like mediators and usually they're attorneys and usually they've been in the business mediation before. So I think it's better to start there. So I think you're, you should always start with mediation. Absolutely. I mean, why not give yourself an opportunity to control your own destiny in a mediation process than throw your destiny to the whims of one or three arbitrators? Yes. Or God forbid, a jury of uh, six of your uh, local peers. They're, they're not your peers. <laughs> the legal system is neither just nor inexpensive. <laughs> I won't touch that one. It would be a long <laughs> afternoon. No, that's, why, that's, why you, that's why you need good document. You're only as good as your documents. Yeah, I was going to leave that one alone, yeah. too. So <laughs> on that note, uh, what I would like to do is just express my, my gratitude and appreciation for this panel, uh, for them coming. Uh, I hope you found the information insightful. I hope you'll take it back uh, for your own businesses and, and share it with others. And that'll wrap up the, this component uh, of the panel discussion. I'm having a blast here at my first business summit. Everyone here has been really nice and meeting all sorts of interesting people and in different industries and everyone has been very generous and kind and informative. I'm learning a lot. Yeah, it's a great environment. I'm definitely coming back next year. I come out to the Treasure Coast Business Expo because we get to connect with a lot of new faces and potential business customers. Everybody 
should come down to the Trader Post Business Summit. Each year, there are hundreds of vendors. You see everybody you haven't seen for over a year at least. And it's just a great place to network your business.